Hello, friends. My name is Sean Kylan. I'm a professor at the University of California at Santa Cruz, and I'm very glad to be with you to talk about Antony and Cleopatra for the Shakespeare 2020 project. Antony and Cleopatra is a totally spectacular play. William Hazlitt, a 19th century writer whose essays about Shakespeare I warmly recommend to you, um, compared Shakespeare's creativity in this play to the life-giving powers of the River Nile. This is what he wrote. Shakespeare's genius has spread over the whole play a richness like the overflowing of the Nile. For me, this play ranks up there with Hamlet and Lear and Macbeth and Othello as one of Shakespeare's major contributions to the genre of tragedy. Shakespeare wrote Antony and Cleopatra in 1606, seven years after Julius Caesar and a kind of sequel to that play. It's the fourth of five texts that Shakespeare set in ancient Rome. I say texts and not plays because one of Shakespeare's Roman works is a narrative poem. The important thing to know about Shakespeare in Rome is that whenever he's writing about Rome, he's writing tragedy. You'll discover that for yourselves if you inquire about the other plays and the poem. Shakespeare's Rome is always undergoing a violent transition between one form of government and another. In Antony and Cleopatra, the transition is between a ruling coalition of three powerful men known as the Second Triumvirate and the beginning of the Roman Empire. The men in the Second Triumvirate were Mark Antony, Lepidus, and the character whom Caesar calls Octavian and Octavius Caesar. Later, he would rename himself as Caesar Augustus. Over the course of the play, the members of the Second Triumvirate fall out with each other. Octavius and Mark Antony confront each other in a massive civil war. And at the Battle of Actium, near the end of the play, Caesar defeats Mark Antony and Cleopatra, consolidates power under himself, and launches what Roman historians call the Pax Augusta, a period of decades of unparalleled peace and prosperity in the Mediterranean basin. Now it's good to know these facts. They provide some context for the events in the play. But the truth, friends, is that Shakespeare isn't really interested in historical events. Or rather, he's only interested in historical events to the extent that they reveal human character. Shakespeare's main source for this play is a book called The Lives of the Noble Grecians and Romans by the ancient writer Plutarch, a Greek-speaking citizen of the Roman Empire. Plutarch's biographies taught Shakespeare that history is not the interplay of impersonal forces such as politics, culture, religion, economics, ideology, international relations. Plutarch taught Shakespeare to think of history as the result of the decisions that particular persons make in relation to the excellencies and deficiencies of their character and the opportunities that life provides for them. As a dramatist, Shakespeare is interested in what human character becomes in the condition of physical danger or emotional duress or moral jeopardy. And that's where we find Mark Antony throughout this play. The political crisis through which Rome is going finds its counterpart in Mark Antony's experience. Mark Antony is torn between the desire to be a Roman general or an Egyptian lover. And he discovers near the end of the play that the attempt to be both at the same time has had disastrous consequences for him. He says to a servant shortly before he commits suicide that he has no more substance, no more definition, 
than the image of a horse that we see in a cloud in the sky. He says that after being in Egypt, he has become as water in water, no shape, no definition, no color, no texture. It's one of Shakespeare's most devastating speeches, and I encourage you to dwell on it when you reach it. Now, speaking of the difference between Romans and Egyptians in this play, one of Antony and Cleopatra's most distinctive stylistic features is the energy and creativity that Shakespeare has put into um, making different vocabularies for Romans and Egyptians. In this play, Rome is a Western conqueror and Egypt is an Eastern province that has been vanquished. Rome is associated with masculinity and Egypt with the femininity embodied in its ruler, Cleopatra. Rome is solid or aspires to be solid and constant like the marble that it uses to build its cities and erect its monuments. But Egypt, taking a cue from its most significant geographical feature, the Nile, is routinely described in terms of its changeableness, its liquidity, its flow. I strongly encourage you to pay attention to the places where these stark dichotomies between Romans and Egyptians emerge in the play. Think about who's speaking this way and what he or she hopes to gain from talking about the difference between Rome and Egypt in these terms. And then step back from that and ask yourself what the play might look like through Egyptian eyes. I think that Shakespeare means for us to understand that this incredibly extensive dichotomous language about Rome and Egypt in the play is a Roman way of thinking, not an actual description of the reality of the situation. You'll find it difficult to escape from the magnetic pull of that Roman thinking, which likes to divide the world into categories so that it's easier to possess. But this play offers an alternative, and that's the way Cleopatra looks at herself and Mark Antony and at the Romans who pass through her country. Pay attention to that too. And that brings me to a final point about Antony and Cleopatra. At the very end of the play, before she takes her own life, Cleopatra expends a lot of energy and effort in changing the narrative about Mark Antony and therefore about herself. By the time that Mark Antony commits suicide, and it's a job that he botches, he has become the protagonist in a story about defeat. But Cleopatra wants to leave the world with the assurance that the story that the world will hear about Mark Antony is a story about triumph. Shakespeare is doing some interesting thinking at the end of the play about the relationship between drama and historical truth. And this is what I mean by that. In the very final scene, we find Caesar standing over the bodies of his two great opponents, Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And on the face of it, this should be a triumph. This is the beginning of what I call the Pax Augusta. This play, which started in conflict and turmoil, has arrived at a point of peace and order. In fact, it has the shape of a comedy, but it doesn't feel that way. It feels like a tragedy. It feels as though more has been lost in the suicides of Mark Antony and Cleopatra than has been gained by the victory of Caesar. Now, why is that the case? Well, one possibility is that Shakespeare is suggesting that the point of drama, or one of the points of drama, is to reveal the truth about history. 
Shakespeare's period venerated Caesar Augustus and the empire that he created as the pinnacle of human civilization. But perhaps Antony and Cleopatra, by making us feel the loss of the two lovers at the center of the play, is engaging in a critique of empire. Maybe the play is telling us that the price of the prosperity and safety and peace that the Roman Empire brought to the Mediterranean world is simply too high to pay. There's another possibility, however, and that is that Shakespeare is acknowledging in this final scene how drama works not to reveal historical truth, but to obscure it. And that is to say, perhaps the point of making us feel sorrow about the loss of Mark Antony and Cleopatra is meant to emphasize for us how committed we are to illusions rather than facts. There is an abundance of evidence in the play that Mark Antony and Cleopatra, noble though they seem to be, are selfish, narcissistic, incompetent, and wicked. The end of the play is forcing us to take sides with Caesar and empire or with Mark Antony and Cleopatra and rebellion. No matter which side we stand on, there are significant costs to pay. If you stand with Caesar in favor of peace and prosperity and order, you're also giving up your freedom. You are embracing the authoritarian rule that came to be associated with the Roman emperors. On the other hand, if you stand with Antony and Cleopatra and value your freedom, the freedom of free love in particular, you appear to be taking sides with chaos and violence. It's an extremely uncomfortable position to be in, but it is the position that we should expect all great tragedy to put us in. And by placing us there between two options for being human, neither of which is particularly attractive and both of which are incompatible with each other. Shakespeare is putting us in the position that Antony has been in the entire time. Whether you discover you are a Roman or an Egyptian by the time you reach the end of the play, I wish you luck. <laughs>